Welcome. This is the meeting of the regular session of the South Kingstown Town Council. The date is Monday, November 8th, 2010. And before we say the pledge, could everybody make sure that they turn off their cell phones? There's been a request for that before the meeting starts. And doing that, please can you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Council President Fogarty. Here. Councilwoman McAtee. Here. Councilman O'Neill. Here. Councilwoman Whaley. Here. Four members present. Council Vice President Eddie is absent. Okay. Next, we have approval of the minutes of previous meetings from the work session of October 25th, 2010. Is there a motion? Move approval of the uh, minutes from the work session dated October 25, 2010. Second. Moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next is a, a meeting minutes from the regular session of October 25th, 2010. I move approval of the minutes of the regular se session of October 25th, 2010. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next is the consent agenda. If anybody would like to remove something from the consent agenda, you could let me know. Hearing none, is there a motion? To approve. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next, we move on to licenses. License A is a resolution to defer consideration of license item 6B through 6I until after the public hearing 7A relative to the renewal of liquor licenses. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. We moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. So we're going to move now to new business items. A. <coughs> Buried in there. A public hearing rel relative to the renewal of liquor licenses for the year beginning December 1st, 2010. Said licenses are granted contingent upon the issuance of a certificate of good standing from the Rhode Island Division of Taxation, compliance with all town ordinances and regulations, the payment of any municipal taxes and user and fees and arrears to the town, and a correction of any fire code violations. Application for license to sell intoxicating beverages under the provision of Title III of the General Laws of 1956 as amended have been filed at the offices as followed. And I'll review each class, and if there's any questions from anybody, they can come forward. Class A retailer is from Jaber's Liquors, 231 Old Tower Hill Road, Wakefield. Patsy's Package Store, Incorporated, 520 High Street, Peacedale, Rhode Island. Sweeney's Package Store, Incorporated, DBA Sweet Sweeney's Wine and Spirits. Uh, 408 Main Street, Wakefield Liquors, 667 Kingston Road, Wakefield, Rhode Island. Is there any questions with Class A? Okay, we'll move on to Class B. Class B Victuler is um, 333 Main Street, Incorporated, DBA, Fat Bellies, Irish Pub, 333 Main Street, Wakefield, Rhode Island. 629 Succotash, LLC, DBA, Matunic Oyster Bar, also at 629 Succotash Road, Wakefield. Applebee's Restaurant North, LLC, DBA, Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar, 15 Commons Corner Way, Bobby G's Incorporated, DBA, Bobby G's Pub, 703 Kingston Road, Captain Jack's Incorporated, DBA, Captain Jack's Restaurant, 706 Succotash Road, Casey's Incorporated, DBA, Casey's Grill and Bar, 191 Old Tower Hill Road, Chen's Restaurant Incorporated, 60 Old Tower Hill Road, Wakefield, Dave Barnes Development Incorporated, DBA, The Muse Tavern, 456 Main Street, Wakefield. Hanson's Pub, LLC, 210 Salt Pond Road, Wakefield. Italian Village, DBA Italian Village Restaurant, 195 Main Street, Wakefield. Kevin V. Finnegan, DBA, Ocean Mist, 895A Matunic Beach Road. Kingstown Sushi Incorporated, DBA Kabuki, 91 Otawa Hill Road. Laurel Food and Beverage Incorporated, DBA Laurel Lane Country Club, 309 Laurel Lane. Old Mountain Lanes Incorporated, DBA Old Mountain Lanes, 756 Kingstown Road. 
Pegasus Pizza Incorporated DBA Estia Pizza and Restaurant, 28 Otawa Hill Road. Pinelli's Cucina Twist Incorporated, DBA Cucina Twist, 2095 Kingstown Road. Pump House Incorporated, 1464 Kingston Road. Rody Joe's LLC, 515 Kingstown Road. Rose Hill Golf Club Incorporated, 220 Rose Hill Road. Shogun Steak and Sushi House, 2 Incorporated, 59 South County Commons Way. The Tipperary Tavern LLC DBA, Tara Mulroy's Joyce's Family Pub, 907A Matunic Beach Road. Tory 2 Corp DBA, Tutoria Romano South, 8 Preservation Way. That's the end of the Class B, Victor. Any questions regarding those? Next is Class B Tavern, Bistro by the Sea, 364 Cods Pond Road, Wakefield, South Kingstown Hotel Association, LLC, DBA Holiday Inn, South Kingstown, 3009 Tower Hill Road, Wakefield. Any questions on the Class B Tavern? Moving on to Class B Hotel, South Kingstown Hotel Associates, LLC, DBA Holiday Inn, South Kingstown, 3009 Tower Hill Road. That's the end of the Class B Hotels. If there's any questions? Moving on to Class B Limited, JSR Corp DBA, Tony's Pizza Palace, 1916 Cor Kingstown Road, Peacedale, Loomis Holding Corp DBA, DBA's Pizza, DB's Pizza, 546 Kingston Road, Phil's Kitchen Incorporated, DBA, Phil's Grill, 323 Main Street. Any question regarding those? Nope. We move on to Class D, Club Full Privilege, the Elks Club of South Kingstown, number 1899, and 60 Belmont Avenue, and the URI Board of Governors Facility Faculty Center, 95 Upper College Road. That's the end of the Class D Victorian license. So again, if there's any questions regarding any of these, if anybody has to come forward. If um, Kath, I think that um, I should probably recuse myself in reference to um, the Phil's license, and I don't know how you want to handle that. Just the fills aren't all of them. Um, just the fills. Just the fills, okay. So we'll make a motion um, to uh, close the public hearing, I guess, first at this point. Do I have a motion to close? Motion to close public hearing. Second. Seconded. Any other discussion? Should I made that amended uh, with um, Ella excusing herself from this? She, to close it. No, okay. I didn't think so. To close it, no. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So why don't we um, move, have a motion to move, excluding the, the fills. Oh, I, sh I should let you guys make the motion. No, 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 not you. <laughs> Keep you out of it completely, actually. Where is this motion? <laughs> Where? You make it. I, I can't make it. I move approval of public hearing A with the amendment of uh, Phil's, Phil's Kitchen, Inc., DBA, Phil's Grill. Okay. And do I have a second? You have a second. Okay, I have a second. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Now we'll have a motion on the other item. I move approval of... Uh, public hearing A as it relates to Phil's Kitchen, Inc., DBA, Phil's Grill. Second. Seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes 3-0 with one abstention. All right. Thank you. Okay. So one, one recusal. recusal I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, recusal. You're right. Recusal. Okay. We will move on back to... Licenses, and we're going to go through. Um, I don't know if we can group these together. Can we go group B through I? Can I have a motion to um, group B through I that we held off at the first license? So moved. Okay. So I didn't make second. The I made the motion. Didn't I? Okay. Why don't you make a motion that we uh, group? Um, Licenses A through I. Okay. I second that motion. Should it be B through I? 
A through I, isn't it? Oh, no, I'm sorry. A through I. Yep, A through I. A through I, all right. A through I. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we got all the licenses all taken care of. I don't have to color code these from now on. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of business going on in town. Okay. Next, we move on to communication items on page eight for the rest of the council. <laughs> page eight, communication A is a communication dated October 20th, 2010 from Susan A. Gustatus, Executive Director, Johnny Cake Center of Peacedale, providing statistical information on their services and encouraging donations of supplies for their programs and initiate in, oh, excuse me, and inviting council members to join the annual Thanksgiving Day food basket distribution at the food pantry is received and placed on file. Council have anything to add to that? Ella? Just that um, it was very successful in all that they give back to our town. It's just absolutely um, wonderful endeavor in this economic difficult time for a lot of families. So we would be honored. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, um, it's information that we uh, wish we didn't have to uh, see this continued uh, uh, growth of uh, those in need, but uh, times, are, times are very difficult out here in our community. But we thank them for their continued great work and look forward to helping them prior to Thanksgiving. I'd also like to uh, thank the Johnny Cake Center and all they do and provide for the community. And their, um, their Thanksgiving Day food basket distribution will be November 22nd from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. at the Emergency Food Pantry. So it's a, an honor to be there to help distribute the uh, Thanksgiving basket. Council, we did this last year as a council, and since we have the same council this coming year, um, I, I, it was a very rewarding night, I think, for all of us, and we were just talking before the meeting that we'll all be there before the, the council meeting to, to hand out baskets. But I think what Susan was really asking is that if anybody, you know, to encourage you know, people out there that they are, and they're always in need of help, but if anybody wants to donate, this is really the time of the year that they, they really need it the most, so make a visit to the Johnny Cake Center. So do I have a motion to... Um, Place this on file. Is there a motion? I move to place communication uh, 8A on file. Second. Second it. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Next is a resolution adopted October 13, 2010, by the Boroughville Town Council in support of General Assembly legislation to enact an extended producer responsibility program and environmental policy approach in which those who produce and use products bear the cost of recycling and responsible disposal is received, placed on file, and the town council further directs. What's the council like to do on this? Well, we discussed this at the work session, and I believe in these uh, economic times that we didn't want to put any more pressure on uh, businesses, so we decided we would place the net although it's a good idea for recycling, um, that everyone recycle. Um, I believe we'd rather not put more restrictions on business at this time and uh, place this on file. Second. Can you just second it? Any other discussion? I think Carol's right. I, I think uh, encouragement is the, uh, uh, the way we need to go right now. Uh, hopefully businesses understand how important it is to, uh, to follow through with their products, but uh, right now, we certainly don't need another uh, hammer on, uh, on business. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Okay, next we move on to comments from interested citizens. If there's anybody who would like to come forward, please come forward. State your name for the record. Hi, my name is Mary Adkins. I spoke at the last meeting to express my concern about the distributed antenna system units that are being installed all over town, otherwise known as DAS units. For people in the audience who didn't attend the last meeting, um, DAS are multiple antenna nodes, also known as repeaters, that mount on existing telephone poles and wires. They're used for wireless communication and emit pulse radio frequency and microwave radiation. 
The DAS units in my neighborhood consist of a black cylindrical box that hangs off the wires, uh, utility wires, and connect to a medical metal box that mounts on the telephone pole. These units are, in fact, the equivalent of putting a cell tower right in your front yard. Last meeting, I described in detail how these devices have been making me very ill with symptoms of fatigue, weakness, muscle spasms, nausea, and migraines, among many others. The day after I spoke to the council, I hired a certified professional to measure radiation levels in my home and yard. My house is a few hundred feet from the DAS at the end of my street. It was expensive to hire this individual, so I opted not to have her draft a formal report, as that would have added to the cost. Instead, she recorded her readings on a worksheet, a copy of which I've included in this package. The specialist I hired recorded a pulsed power density of 2,400 microwatts per meter squared right at the corner of Peaked Rock Road and Allen Avenue, which is only approximately 20 to 30 feet from the house on the corner. This number is equivalent to 0.24 microwatts per centimeter squared. This level of radiation is considered to be of extreme concern, especially for those people living in houses right near the DAS. Luckily, I live further down the street, but frankly, I feel sick about the people living down by the corner. In fact, the woman who took these readings said if she were living in one of those houses, she would be packing her bags immediately. As she continued down the street, she recorded the following levels. 1,340 microwatts per meter squared at the house number 200, 450 at house number 185, 39 at house number 174, and 33 at house number 159. So it did drop as you continued down the street. But for those individuals living towards the end of the street, it's quite high. Even at levels as low as 33 microwatts per meter squared, which is equivalent to 0 0.0033 microwatts per centimeter squared, which was recorded a few hundred feet away, the following biological effects are known to occur. Sleep disorders, abnormal blood pressure, nervousness, weakness, fatigue, limb pain, joint pain, digestive problems, effects on the immune system, and altered EEG. At 0.24 microwatts per centimeter squared, which is the level right at the unit itself and the neighboring houses. The above health effects and more are known to occur. Things like altered white blood cell activity in children, cardiac arrhythmias, change in calcium ion efflux from brain tissue, impaired motor function, reaction time, memory, and attention in children, twofold increase in childhood leukemia, infertility, decreased cell growth, changes in melatonin levels, disturbed carbohydrate metabolism, altered adrenal hormone levels, and structural changes in liver, spleen, testes, and brain. Remember, these units are going up all over town, with many literally outside people's bedroom windows. They are emitting this radiation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In my front yard, which is a few hundred feet away, the certified professional recorded pulses of 2,400 microwatts per meter squared which is equivalent to the full strength signal recorded right next to the unit itself. Levels in my front yard where my children play were 168 microwatts per meter squared. Again, a very dangerous level, a few hundred feet away. Levels inside my home, in my bedroom, reached as high as 37 microwatts per meter squared. I cringe at the thought of the radiation levels inside those homes right near these devices. As I explained at the last meeting, current safety standards adopted by the FCC are inadequate to protect public health because they are not biologically based. Something needs to be done. I have a request for help in to someone who is involved in a similar effort in Hempstead, New York. But in the meantime, I again implore the town council to issue a moratorium to stop any further installation of wireless communication antennas of any kind in South Kingstown until this matter can be properly reviewed. Local officials have a responsibility to take action when our state and federal agencies fail to protect us. A review process needs to be put into place. It's my understanding, um, and this isn't on the material I'm gonna give you, but it's my understanding that, again, I think I explained this last time, we can't stop them from putting these devices in because they cause health problems. However, we do have a right as a town to put ordinances into place so that there's an actual review process because there are avenues by which you can 
request that they be placed in other areas. Um, and I went through those last time in terms of property values, aesthetics, things of that nature. I feel very strongly that people in town have a right to know that these DAS units have been installed and that there are potential health effects. This radiation is invisible, and because of this, it is even more dangerous. Residents whose homes are close to these DAS units are not even aware they've been installed, and they do have a right to know this. I'm willing to assist in any way that I can, and I'm asking that you please do something before more people are irreversibly harmed. Are you going to give us a packet? Yes. <laughs> Can I ask if, I know everybody was busy with the election, um, can I ask if anyone's had time to look at the material that I passed in last time? I gave a general overview of your thing. I did not get into all of it, and I wanted to go to that website that you had in New, in, from New York, and I have not had a chance to go through that. So just some general overview of some of the stuff that you sent me. Um, I don't know about the rest of the council. I haven't had a chance to talk to anyone about it. Did anyone else have a chance to look at it? No, I haven't. I, I asked, um, I think Steve and Andy have had a chance to uh, look at some of the uh, websites. Um, my concern is, uh, well, two concerns. One, um, um, as a community municipality within a state, maybe Steve, you could um, help us out with uh, how we can uh, um, either encourage or how do we ask the uh, the government, particularly the communications folks, uh, what do they know? What can we do? Or is there nothing we can do? And that's a uh, uh, just a rule that's in place. Uh, As I indicated uh, earlier uh, to the council, I would uh, say that the issue that's before you is not one that's going to be addressed at the local level. Certainly, uh, all of the information that you have indicates that the uh, uh, Federal Communications Act, Section 704, bars the town from pro prohibiting their, those installations. The issue really is a federal government issue. It's an issue that really, uh, only through direction under Congress, is there going to be changes uh, in the statute or there are going to be changes that would be associated with uh, the effects, uh, the biological effects of the radiation. And it may be uh, well that the information be forwarded to the legislative delegation and request them to provide comment on whether they see concerns with the current level of regulation provided at the federal level. They've created the situation by, uh, by superseding both state and local uh, regulatory authority in terms of the siting of antennas and the DAS units. So I think the question really needs to go uh, to the federal level to say, are you comfortable based on the information on both sides of the table? Because there are people that would argue that uh, this is not a problem uh, for somebody to uh, provide some type of a, a statement. There have been statements made through the EPA questioning uh, or indicating that right now the, uh, the only regulations uh, and standards that are there deal with, with thermal and that they do not deal with the biological. Uh, I don't know whether that's the end line or whether that's just one of, the, uh, one of the arguments that are being made on the other side of the table. But I think that it may be a, a, a question that should be, uh, should be brought forward to our congressional delegation and senatorial delegation to have them provide us with their interpretation of what the standards are or what steps they're taking uh, to provide better information. But it's not something that we're gonna be able to do in 39 different cities and towns or in, uh, in the 50 states. It's really going to be uh, part of what the uh, uh, what central government needs to address. Uh, you know, this is an issue that's going on not just in the United States, it's worldwide. Uh, and I can't say that uh, 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 Mary's wrong in what her concerns are, nor can I say that she's right. Uh, and I think that at this point, uh, uh, if there's going to be any type of a independent determination made, it's going to need to be made through federal intervention. Can is, maybe is it, is it overkill with the number of these uh, DAS units put in place? Does that radial arm just 
cover every circle um, once and twice over? Do we have any, um, any information on that? Or do they put them at the furthest distance they can so the circles just touch? Uh, do we have any idea uh, whether there's over When the first not? application came in for the DAS sightings in town, we did an exhaustive review of what our regulatory authority was. And what our determination was, was that we did not have uh, the ability to regulate and that the sighting of those on uh, utility poles was not even regulated through the, uh, through the Public Utilities Commission. Public, mil uh, uh, public Utilities simply provided authorization for licensing agreements between the pole owner, either Narragansett uh, uh, National Grid or AT&T, to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the providers on the DAS. The DAS units that have been placed in town uh, were presented as uh, being cited based on where there were holes in coverage. And the holes were small enough where they could be covered with the DAS rather than attempting to bring a full-size antenna into those, those neighborhoods. So there was uh, the placement of those units were based on that, on that type of a consideration. Uh, once we reviewed uh, the information that was provided, and in fact, South Kingstown, I think, has provided greater review with the legal reviews being done as to what our regulatory authority was, uh, and I'm, I'm sure uh, several of the other communities that have had this. Uh, but again, it's a case where they have the legal right to be there. If there isn't a federal standard that's protecting uh, people from uh, improper radiation dosages, it needs to come through the federal authorities. So just to wrap it up, just so if Mary came through with a, a petition of hundreds of concerned folks um, the best we can do is encourage our congressional delegation to... Um, I'm saying they're the only ones that are going to have the resources to be able to address this type of question because if you were to consider an ordinance that provided regulatory authority similar to what uh, uh, Ms. Atkins has requested in the first letter that she sent with the eight proposals that she had in that letter uh, to have a 1,500-foot uh, 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 circumference around any... Uh, installation of an antenna. It's interesting to note that that deals with prospectively. It doesn't deal retroactively with all those facilities that are currently cited in the community. Nor does it deal with any that are going to be uh, going to be cited prior to those type of regulations being put into effect. So if there is a way of dealing holistically with the issue, it's not going to be through local regulation because of the prospective nature of the of the ordinance requirements. It would have to come through some type of uh, federal authority that is dealing with uh, safety standards. And those safety standards don't exist at this point. Can I make a couple of comments and ask a few questions? Um, when you say that they had a gap in coverage, how did they technically prove that? I wasn't involved with the, uh, with, with the direct discussion. The director of planning uh, reviewed the, the information with, the, uh, with those companies. Because when you say that nothing can be done at the local level, I have to disagree with that. And this is what's going on in the town of Hempstead in Long Island. Um, there is an ordinance in place that does provide for a review process. And there are certain steps that can be taken at the municipal level in terms of the siting of these DAS units. Again, um, but that ordinance is prospective in nature. It's not dealing with the issue. If, in fact, there is a problem that exists, I understand. that ordinance is not dealing with the problem. That's the, that's the point I right. would make to you. And, and in terms of what can be done at the local level, there are things that can be done. In fact, there are many towns and municipalities in this country that are um, basically petitioning their senators and their congressmen and asking for the repeal of Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act. So when it comes from a town or municipality versus just one ordinary citizen, I think the senators and the congressmen take special note of that. So for example, the city of Los Angeles, um, this Los Angeles Unified School District has asked their senators and congressmen to repeal Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act because it only provides for protection against thermal effects and not biological effects. If our town would make a similar appeal, that could go a long way towards um, prompting our senators and our congressmen to do something about this. 
But in the meantime, there is a local ordinance that could be put into place. I'm trying to get a copy of the one from Hempstead right now, which would at least provide a review process and give us more options than we seem to have right now in terms of the siting of these units. And it would be looking at things like pr technically proving that there's a gap in coverage before allowing them to place the units. Um, looking at things like property values and aesthetics, which you do under the federal law have a right to refuse siting of these um, units based on property values and aesthetics. So these are avenues by which we could try to protect health, but do it in a legal way using the existing law. The existing law is inadequate, and that is a fact based on the science. Again, there are people in industry who would disagree with that, but I tend to put more weight on independent scientists than I do on industry scientists. So under the law, there are provisions that will allow us to take steps to um, protect people, but do it in a legal way by using property values, aesthetics, the Migratory Bird Act, for example. Um, those are all avenues that are open to us as a town. Um, so again, also, you know, if there was something issued from the town to our congressmen and senators, that would also go a long way towards attempting to fix the problem at the federal level. But in the meantime, you have people who are living right next to these devices who still don't know that they've been placed. Um, who could be suffering health effects and don't know the source. And that's an ethical issue that I feel really needs to be addressed. I mean, there, aren't, there are some people in town who don't pay attention to what goes on in town council meetings or you know, who wouldn't have access to this information. I believe they have a right to know that these units are placed outside their homes. Um, in fact, I have a neighbor who told me that one of our neighbors at the end of the street, their child had been sick for two weeks, and it coincidentally started when these units went up. Now, was it from the units? I don't know. I have no way to prove that. But what if that child remains sick? What if they develop a chronic health issue? Um, don't those people have a right to know what's radiating right near their home so that they can then make a choice as to whether or not they want to stay there? Um, I think this is information that the public has a right to know. So while we're trying to decide what we can or can't do as a town, I feel there's an obligation to let people know that these units have been placed. They are discreet. It's very difficult to detect them. The only reason I could detect them is because I have a meter that measures the radiation. Um, the, the levels that this woman found on my street are alarming. From what I know from over 2,000 hours of research on this subject, these are alarming levels of radiation. And the fact that the federal government allows this is inexcusable. And you're right, something does need to be done and it needs to be done on the federal level. But in the meantime, as a town, we should do everything we can to protect our citizens as we're able to under the law as it currently exists. And one of the things we can do is to let people know that they're there and what the health effects possibly could be. Um, I don't have an easy answer. I wish I did. I mean, I'm severely affected by these um, units, you know, and I've noticed that there are, there's a difference in terms of the amount of radiation that some of them are putting out, and I find it very coincidental that the ones that are putting out the most radiation are all situated at stop signs and red lights, where people are, you know, sitting still for a period of time, in many cases a few minutes. Um, and that's a huge concern, you know. Why in the world there are units that are emitting more at intersections where people are stopped um, is, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't even wanna propose a theory on that. Um, but you know, the people that are living right next door to them, it, it's a serious health hazard for them. It may be that the federal law allows this, but that doesn't excuse us from not informing them. There's nothing to stop us from informing them, and, and I believe they have the right to know, so. No, I, I haven't suggested that people don't have the right to know. I know, yeah, I'm, I'm just restating that for the council because I, I feel very strongly that, uh, that something should be done in that regard. As I said, the woman that came to my home, she, she does this for a living and she's a certified professional, and she said she would be packing her bags, she would not hesitate, even if she owned the home and you know, couldn't sell, she said she wouldn't even ethically sell the home, she couldn't she would be packing her bags. 
Um, and I know for certain that these things have severely affected my health. Um, there are young children playing all over my neighborhood, and most of the parents don't know that these things are there. Um, you know, I, I feel that what's happening at a federal level is a travesty. Um, as a town, I think we should do everything we can to change that. Um, and if anyone has other suggestions, I, I'd love to hear them. There are people like me all over this country trying to get something done about this, and we, we could certainly use the support of um, our, our local people in the town to help us. Steve, who would we call for the installers? I, I guess I, f I would find it hard to believe that we're not fully and totally covered uh, town-wide at the moment. Um, I, I can't imagine too many gaps left, so we're, we're looking forward. I guess my question to you, Mary, is if, if you're next to this thing or a thousand feet away, is the service equal in quality? Well, that's a good question. Does it fade away? I, that, help me there's out. A, that's why I asked about the radiation. As far arms. as the radiation levels, it does fade away the further away you get from it. But in fact, you know, I, as I said, I live a few hundred feet away from this unit, and in my front yard, we picked up pulses at full power at the 2400 um, microwatt level. So um, they're going for very long distances. But the service is still of well, equal quality. Well, and that's why I was asking about, is there have they technically proved a gap in coverage? Because as far as I know, the people that live in my neighborhood that use cell phones, I don't use a cell phone, but the people I know that do, they've never had a problem getting service. So one of the things that other towns are doing in this review process that I talk about when they do enact an ordinance is demanding that these companies prove technically that there's a gap in coverage because if there isn't they have no reason to place these at all so if people in my neighborhood have been able to get cell phone coverage just fine why in god's name are we now putting dozens of these units all over my neighborhood there's no reason for it that was my question are, are yeah built out of this is so, there a way to calm this right down? so these are some of the things that we can do under the law we can demand that they prove technically that there's a gap in coverage not just say there's a gap in coverage but prove it with documentation that is one way to eliminate any more of these installations from going up another thing we can use is property values if people have a DAS unit in front of their house, their property value is going to go down. Right now, a lot of people aren't aware of what these units are, but there is a national campaign to educate the public about this. And soon, everyone is going to know what they are. And when they do, people will not want to buy your house if you have one of these units out front. It's just like having a cell tower in your backyard. Nobody wants a house that's near a cell tower. No one's going to want to buy a house that's near one of these. So um, the Migratory Bird Act, that's another avenue. You can actually deny a placement of one of these units based on the Migratory Bird Act, but not for health effects. As absurd as that sounds, that is the truth. So we have avenues open to us, and what I'm asking the council to do is to explore these options. As I said, I'm trying to get a copy of the ordinance from Hempstead that will give us some guidance as to how to go about this. Um, and as soon as I get that, I'll forward it to you. But I, I really am begging you to do everything that you can to stop further placement of these units um, and to inform the public and to consider writing to our congressmen and our senators and all the way up to the president, um, the governor, everyone, um, to inform them that Section 704 is, you know, it's, it's harming our health. This law, which was written by the industry and deregulated the industry, is harming millions and millions of people in this country. And the more towns that we have standing up to our government officials and saying, this is unacceptable, you know, you're endangering our citizens, the, the greater the likelihood that we'll be able to get it changed. So I'm asking all of you to please consider doing that, and I'll get you the information that I I get from Hempstead as soon as possible. Why don't you get us that information and then we can discuss about maybe a resolution up to our congressional and senatorial district about that section 704. Okay, and I again, I'm willing to do anything I can. I've done an awful lot of research on this and I will also offer again to take any of you on a drive around town so that you can hear for yourselves the amount of radiation that's in our town. As I said before, it's invisible, so people are very complacent about it and they don't realize that it's there. When you have a meter like the one that I have that converts it to an audio signal, you will be shocked at how much radiation is in this town already. 
And that's why any further placement of devices like this needs to be carefully considered. So I, I'd offer to you again to take a ride around town with you so that you can hear for yourself just what's out there. It's very difficult when something is intangible to realize the magnitude of it. When you have an audio meter that puts it in a, in a way that your senses can detect, it, it puts a whole other level to it. So I, I offer that again to any of you at any time. Kathy, let me make sure that okay. we're, we're clear. Okay, My recommendation wasn't to ask to have Section 704 repealed. My uh, suggestion to you was that to uh, send the information that's been collected and forwarded to the council to the senatorial and congressional delegation and to ask them to review it and to determine whether they believe that there's appropriate standards in place today for the protection of uh, health and safety. Uh, if one was to suggest the repeal of Section 704 without uh, providing any type of standards to allow regulation to occur on, there would be no regulation. Okay. Because as soon as you have a public hearing to put regulations into effect, the industry, as they were in Hampton, on September 21st, when they first considered the ordinance, are going to be there to attest to the fact that, that this is not a safety issue. You're not gonna place the council in a position, or any local, uh, community officials in a position where they're going to be able to argue the merit of your case or the demerit of the industry's case. It needs to be done through some type of study that is going to be through independent uh, uh, consultants that are going to be uh, uh, providing the information through, uh, whether it's uh, congressional committees and the forging of federal legislation. But to simply ask for the section to be uh, withdrawn, which prohibits the regulation without providing the standards, is as dangerous a situation uh, as having the regulations in effect if, in fact, your argument is correct. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we repeal it without replacing it with biologically based standards. So let me be clear on that. Um, and I'm also not suggesting that you have an argument with the industry at a public hearing about health effects because we already know that you can't deny placement of the units because of health effects. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I am suggesting is looking at the other towns throughout this country that are asking for the repeal of Section 704 and to hopefully join those other towns in asking that it be repealed and that it be replaced, uh, that the thermal standards that are in place be replaced with biologically based standards. And I want to clarify that that's actually what I wrote down here about reviewing the section for that I said you've had thermal testing but we need to look at biological effects and then a technical review of the gaps in coverage about that's what we would pass on as a resolution not to repeal that. Right. That's something we can get to in, in step process. So that's what I caught from it. That's what I think that we'll put in a resolution if the council you know, agrees to that. Um, and that's what I think we should look at. Go ahead, Kathy. I just want to say, Mary, um, in your comment, you said uh, you've studied this for 2,000 hours. Over, I mean, yeah. You know, we, we really are not as familiar with it. And you make a very compelling argument, no doubt. But um, we did discuss it earlier at the work session. And uh, Mr. Alfred brought us up to snuff on some of the material that you've given him. And that, of course, we were all here last uh, two weeks ago when we heard you give uh, your statement as to what the problem is. but. For many of us, it, myself, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I think we really need some time. And this is the type of thing that you can't learn overnight. And, right. You know, we can't do anything right away. This would have to be looked at, studied, uh, you know, and that all takes a lot of time. Like you said, 2,000 hours of your own uh, time. I, mean, I understand that. I guess so. what, what motivates me here and coming here, again, is, is with what I know, I, I am very concerned, particularly for the people that are living right near these units. Um, and I, that's why I strongly recommend that you get up to speed as soon as you can. But I do understand there's a huge learning curve involved. Yeah. And in fact, I, you know, I've been studying it for a very long time now. Um, and I was motivated by two very sick children. So, um, you know, I, I had a lot more, I guess, um, impetus to do something about it. But I, I understand completely. But that's why I'm saying I'm at your disposal. If there's anything that you want to ask, any research, I mean, I have an inordinate amount of research that I could share. So I'm willing to meet with you privately, 
you know, however I can help, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Question, Zella? Yeah, Mary, I just have a question. With all of the research that you've done, have there been any experimentation to protect individuals that are real highly sensitive, such as you? The only um, avenue we have for that is um, basically like shielding material in your home. But that doesn't protect you when you're out in your car, when you're out in public, um, when you're walking the streets. Um, there's, there's no protection. I mean, this is one of the reasons that Section 704 is so damaging. It, it basically allowed the industry to proliferate wireless devices without any safety testing. Um, and so our bodies, are, you know, we're, we're considered collateral damage, basically. The industry is, you know, racking up billions in profits, and all of us are suffering the health effects. And I can show you studies from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, which hands out the Nobel Prize for Medicine, that clearly demonstrates that the advent of wireless technology began the decline of the overall health of the population. Um, that's, a, that's a scientific study that was completed by them. So, um, you know, this, this Section 704 was very damaging to the public. Um, and so as far as protection, no, there's not much that, that people like I can do, you know, that myself could do. And, um, and for the general public who maybe isn't highly sensitive, the problem is if, if we are to look at what the scientists are telling us, you may not be highly sensitive now, but by 2017, 50% of the population will be because of the, the enormous amount of radiation that's now out there. And you're talking about co-located installations where you have multiple cell towers and multiple DAS units and multiple WiMAX units going simultaneously. I mean, there's just no long-term cumulative studies to, to look at the effects of that. Uh, it's a huge public health problem. So the more that our towns can get involved with this and try to prompt our you know, upper levels of government to do something, the better. Can you, um, radiation, the 2400 number, any way to even measure that against uh, when I sit in a dentist chair and they take an x-ray by mouth and I'm covered with a shield? That's two different types of radiation. Two different types of radiation, but yep. you can't somehow or another equalize those to some extent? I can tell you that the non, this is non-thermal, considered non-thermal radiation. Um, I can tell you that the long-term chronic effects of non-thermal radiation are equally damaging as the effects of the type of radiation that you're talking about from x-rays, gamma rays, things of that nature, the ionizing. There, it's all damaging, particularly with chronic long-term exposure. And that's what we're talking about. When you have a unit right outside your bedroom window going 24 hours a day, that's a long-term chronic exposure. So it may not heat tissue the way that ionizing radiation does, like an x-ray does, but the long-term effects are equally deadly. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, any other comments? No? Um, oh. I'm sorry. Steve, I'm actually asking the council, uh, is there some way that we could ask our General Assembly members, new members, old members, but the, uh, um, to have them in here in December before they get busy in January, I think we really need to um, be on the same page with our delegation to uh, um, establish our concerns uh, uh, early on uh, where they stand. I'd love to have a meeting with them in December too. Uh, I, I, I think that's probably what we'll probably end up doing. I know the school committee is also looking to get them in um, in December. It probably would not be a bad idea to maybe meet together. Um, so maybe we could work that out between the, the two. I know Every time we meet together, we have seven and five. We've got 12 people with questions. Um, I could spend three hours with them and you not finish. want to do finish. alone? That's fine, too. Yeah, I know. I'd, I'd really yeah, love the council. We'll have to see what their availability is. Okay. All right. But is, is there something, uh, direct I, Steve, towards uh, see if you can put together a date? I think Steve and I actually had talked about something like that, too, the legislators in December, um, getting into that wonderful budget season that we're. Yeah, in Thursday's packet, I'll provide the council with a series of meetings for budget development. Uh, first one, which would be in December. Uh, if you want, we can try to add a, a couple of other dates to keep open to see if we can get the legislators uh, to meet. The only thing you'll need to tell me collectively is whether you want that with the school committee or without the school committee. Uh, 
every time we meet with them, no, there's just never enough time. Okay. I mean, I mean, if you want to go to 12 or 1, I'd be happy to, but honestly, I, I have here, enough to keep them busy for two or three hours. Is that all right with the rest of the council? So you are asking for two separate dates, one with the legislators and if one with possible, yeah. the I mean, the schools are going to be talking about the education funding formula and school budgets, obviously, but I think we've got an array of issues. Yeah, I think the legislators... To URI, to our hospital, to our road. I mean, we, we really have... Uh, I mean, we are in charge of, of this community. or we, we look at all the facets, uh, all the areas that uh, the budget concerns are going to bring forward. And uh, I, I'm just worried, once we lose control of them in January through June, it, it's, it's going to be a very busy year, and we'll, it will never see them again. I, I do think that the um, legislators do need to hear the dialogue between the town council and the school committee. I mean, that is going to be a heavy item that we focus on, I, I, I believe. Um, well, they can work on their own date and we'll work on our own dates. Okay. With, with Try to get a couple of dates? Yes. Okay. Great. Sounds good. All right. And, Ella? Thanks, Kath. Um, I just wanted to bring you some of the news from the chamber um, tomorrow. They're doing a lean and green workshop talking about recycling. Um, it is tomorrow from 8 to 9 at the chamber. The cost is free, and it's for businesses to look at the environmental um, waste and using lean and green tools and techniques so it can reduce cost. So we did mention that um, recycling at businesses this morning. There's an opportunity for the businesses in town. Um, I also stopped by on Friday to look at the banners that they have. Um, Adopt a banner sponsorship program, absolutely beautiful. Um, there are still some available for some of the businesses, so um, they're going to be going up around town, and I really think that it's, you know, quite nice. And then there's a blood drive, December 4th, um, 11 to 2. And last but not least, there is an annual coat drive. So if anybody has any coats to keep. Children and adults warm. They'll take them at the chamber and bring them down um, to a further location. What date is that? The coat drive, um, there's not a specific date, but you can drop them off Yep, at the chamber. And last but not least, um, Steve, Mr. Ayakoy says you will get yours hand delivered. It's the um, South Kingstown Chamber of Business and Community Guide. So it's out. It's quite nice. And then last, I just wanted to mention some exciting events that happened in the community. Um, there was a celebration at Broad Rock Middle School. I would say there was probably 75 to 100 people that gathered and walked down and had a parade to a little youngster, a young adult, fifth grader with the uh, Dennis Moffitt makeover so it was quite an exciting time um, and really exciting time for the family and then there was the education exchange i think that we were all at um, absolutely a warm welcoming place for our community and i know that they have some great goals set for educating um, a lot of the uh, youth and adults in our town and uh, there was also the chamber annual dinner um, which a few of us attended, and it was absolutely delightful, and many awards were given um, to some of the people in town. And I know, Kathy, you mentioned the South Kingston Educational Foundation. I did not go to that, but... I did, I did we had something else that night, but I knew that uh, other people had attended that, and they had a very big success, too, with their, um, their fundraiser they did a few months before. But Peggy Benz, I do want to give her kudos for the education exchange, because the building is absolutely beautiful, and uh, just a... Uh, I know it's a big step up from what they had before. So one door open, uh, closes, another one opens, and they really, um, she was calling me lost without a place at the government center, and um, you know she was able to work out with the, uh, the lily pads office space and what a spot she's got now. So she was upset, but I think in the long run that, that came true. You know, what a great place Beautiful. now. So. Um, okay, anything else? Jim? Oh, yeah, Kathy, just uh, maybe Andy or Steve could um, talk about uh, Thursday's uh, ceremony and parade activity when uh, Steve or Andy would like to cover that in their dialogue. Okay. Terry's, Terry's parade. Terry, Terry. Veterans Day parade. Veterans Day, Veterans Day, parade. Day parade, Thursday. <laughs> Always like to give Terry Andy some. Andy used to do that, but Terry does TV time. <laughs> 
uh, the annual Veterans Day Parade sponsored by the uh, Vietnam Veterans Association and the VFW and also the Town Recreation Department will be held on Thursday, November 11th at 10 a.m. And it kicks off at the corner of Holly and Main Street and the entire community is welcome to join us. At the end of the parade at Suckatucket Park, there will be a memorial ceremony um, in honor of veterans and that will um, be directly following the parade. Will there be snow on Thursday, Terry? It looks I don't like think it's going to be so. much nicer. It, looks, no, it looks like the weather will be fine for Thursday. Oh, good. So. good, good, all right. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. <laughs> that, we move to the town manager's report. Ella and Terry said everything I was going oh, to say. Wow. <laughs> Went right out of your sales. Sorry. Unless there's any questions, I yield. Our right, town solicitor's report, Nancy. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Um, appointments, we covered this month's appointments. Um, so we'll move on to new business items, and we're going to move on to new business item B as a resolution authorizing an award of bid to Narragansett Dock Works Incorporated, 14 Gull Road, Narragansett, Rhode Island, for the following village green improvement project elements, pedestrian bridge, bridge abutments, masonry walls, and electrical upgrades in accordance with all bid and specifications in an amount not to exceed $69,397, including a contingency, and is further described in the memorandum from... Our leisure services director to the town manager dated November 1st. And As noted, uh, the council's in receipt of a uh, memo from, uh, from Terry Murphy relative to this project. Uh, what's recommended to the council tonight is to award for several components of the improvements that are planned at uh, the Village Green. These include the uh, replacement of the pedestrian bridge, the uh, concrete bridge abutments, uh, and the uh, granite wall installation, as well as electrical upgrades in the park. The cost that's uh, uh, been negotiated on this was a revision from an original uh, bid that was more comprehensive. There were 17 components to the original bid, two companies <coughs> bid, Roberts and Rocher and uh, Narragansett Dock Works. Uh, Roberts and Rocher have withdrawn their bid uh, from consideration and there's been negotiation to reduce uh, reduce some of the costings that have been proposed by Narragansett Dock Works. The work that's being proposed for tonight uh, is actually the lowest uh, price uh, of the two contractors even if Roberts and Rocha were still uh, able to do the project. In fact it's about $5,100 less than what uh, uh, Robertson Rocher had proposed. This project has about $250,000 in funding. We've spent at this point approximately $53,000, which was on the uh, work for the design, the play apparatus designs, uh, as well as the ground crubber. What we're looking to do now is for the replacement of the, uh, the bridge, so it'll be handicapped uh, accessible bridge, as well as uh, to uh, provide for the electrical upgrading. What we expect is with the 250,000, 150 of that is from a, a DEM grant. It's a 70-30 funding grant, which means that uh, for every $100 we spend, they, replace, uh, they reimburse us $70. So what we're looking at at this point uh, is a project that will cost uh, approximately $250,000 in total, uh, but we've broken it out so that only certain portions of the entire project will be done out of house. We will be taking uh, responsibility in-house for acquisition of a number of materials as well as some of the labor that would have gone into this project. Uh, that which is specialty work, which we do not have the staff to uh, uh, be able to complete, we would put out as a second contract that hopefully the council will see in the next few months. Uh, so at this point, the only thing that's being requested and recommended is the authorization for Narragansett uh, Dock Works for the replacement of the bridge, the abutments, the electrical upgrading, and the, uh, the granite walls. The rest of the material will be coming forward to the council in future months we're hopeful to have uh, all of the materials purchased as well as the uh, contract for installation of the paving materials uh, sometime next spring. 
Uh, but overall, we hope to be able to uh, spend all of the $150,000 grant and match that with $100,000 that we have in capital budget funding from prior years support for this project. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Yeah, Judge, what a great asset. I, I, I guess I sometimes wish we could move forward. Could we do everything by next summer on your wish list, yes. all the money? Could we get it ready for next summer? As detailed, uh, Jim, on the uh, I saw it. On the second page of the memorandum, it shows you that we're expecting that we could spend $186,000, uh, and we're showing how those materials would be spent. The town would buy about 77000 in materials, and we would have another $45,000. But that would uh, deal with all of the 17 components that were part of the project. That doesn't include any of the work that was involved or recommended in the original architectural plans for the development of a, uh, uh, of a stage area within the, uh, within the green. Uh, I believe it also doesn't uh, cover the cost of the seating area that would be on the, uh, the guild side of the river. Uh, but it will get most of the work done. The playground equipment uh, is not a part of this, uh, this project at this point. It'll be subject to future funding requirements within the capital budget. But with enough coordination, most of this could be accomplished uh, before uh, next year, next That's summer. That's correct. You know, uh, as I had said earlier to you, I'd like to see replacement on some of the recreation apparatus that's there, uh, but that's not a component of the project. The existing uh, units will continue to be used. We have replaced all of the swings, but with the replacement of the swings, there'll have to be uh, boxing of the, or the staging area itself, with the placement of the uh, soft materials. So that's all gotta be done as well. Dinosaur's gonna stay, right? <laughs> Dinosaur gonna stay? Yeah. yeah. You know, it survived during one of the floods when its nose was just sticking out of the water, you know, so it's gonna stay, it's gonna stay. All right, um, do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve new business item B. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next is a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. It, the meeting is adjourned at uh, 832.